I want to introduce Marcella Ayala, who is with Barnards. Barnards was the co um, contractor for the Vignus Interim Housing Project. And with this in mind, um, what we're doing here with this particular um, discussion is looking at one case to examine a, a best practice that we can replicate elsewhere. Uh, our annual Design for Dignity Conference will be coming up at the end of June, and we'll be connecting with everyone on this call to, to share more about that conference as we approach. But for that, right now, uh, I welcome Mar Marcella to the call. Marcella, thank you for being here. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you for uh, having us today. We appreciate being here, and uh, thank you for uh, being part of this Design for Dignity series leading up to your conference in June. And uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Marcella Ayala. I am Director of Business Development at Bernard's. And I want to thank you for joining us um, in this important and ongoing dialogue on one of the most complex issues facing our society today. And that is how to house a growing homeless population in a rapid and cost-effective manner. You know, to set the context, I recall when I was at the LA Mayor's office and the homelessness count in the County of Los Angeles was a staggering 40,000 people. And this was back in 2011. That's a decade ago. And today that figure has increased by 65% to 66,000 people. It is in this pressing urgency and in the face of the pandemic that the County of Los Angeles rushed to the fire to address this homelessness crisis. And today our panelists will take us behind the scene as to what it took to get this project off the ground from designed, manufactured, constructed and permitted all within 120 days to substantial completion at one of the lowest price points in the market. But before I introduce you to our panelists, I would like to take you on a virtual tour of the project guided by two of our site leaders, Lou Diaz with Bernard's and Luis Griffin with NAC Architecture, who are absolutely relentless in their commitment and dedication to seeing this project through a successful and execution and delivery. So let's get there. Let me be there with me as I put up the video. Share my screen. Voila. Vignes Street Interim Housing Project is located in downtown Los Angeles, adjacent to the thriving Chinatown District and the historic Los Angeles State Park. Vignes is part permanent and temporary interim housing, a project meant to house the homeless, a condition made even worse during the COVID pandemic. It consists of 232 dwelling units in a combination of mobile trailers and modified shipping container buildings. There also exists an administration building which houses offices for support staff and a full commercial kitchen and dining room. Lastly, the site is situated on over four acres, which allow for site landscape plazas and other outdoor amenities. So we were, NAC was already looking at a test fit for Vignes, uh, which was uh, the repurposed uh, trailers, dorm-like uh, beds for people experiencing homelessness. And as the pandemic and as we saw spikes in Los Angeles, Supervisor Hilda Solis realized that how critical this was. And there was a board letter to fund the build out of as many beds as possible, that board motion was passed. So that's when all five supervisors, championed by Supervisor Hilda Solis, agreed that this was an emergency and we were to go as quickly as we can to provide beds for people experiencing homelessness. We had already done a test fit uh, of, of getting approximately 120 people plus wraparound services. And as we were completing that, we saw COVID-19 hit and a spike, it, particularly here in Los Angeles, the county said, wait, we need to reconsider this site. So we went as dense as we could and the dorm type layout wasn't appropriate anymore. We needed to look at each individual, each client to have their own bed and their own bathroom, which is a shower, a lab, a water closet, and their own 
uh, HVAC. So not a centralized heating and cooling, but, but a, a localized. And that's how 1060 North Vignes uh, evolved to be the, the project that it is today, driven by COVID-19. If you look at it, just the raw data, the county needed to build a project during a pandemic owned by the county in the city of Los Angeles on a contaminated site in three biggest holidays of the year and can you do it in just a few months. Anyone in the industry is going to know that, wow, you, you pretty much have every obstacle going against you. Timing was a major factor on this project and sourcing was key. Our partner, Vesta Modular, conducted a nationwide search for plans that could accommodate the scale and speed of the project. As a result, each building type came to the site in Los Angeles from different sources. The single-use shipping container buildings were the most local from Crate Modular in Carson. They modified and outfitted 66 containers and stacked them three high. The 20 mobile trailers traveled to the site from the builder Gurdon in Idaho, and the nine wood frame modules for the administration building from Palomar Modular in Texas. Over 60,000 square feet, all delivered to the site in less than 90 days. When we first got to the site, we had to address our first challenge, which was contaminated soils. To address the contaminated soils quickly, we came up with a plan to create an on-site treatment plant that would allow us to off-haul the soils. While off-hauling the soils, we started constructing the foundations for the three-story container buildings, as well as the administration. While work on-site was ongoing, construction of our prefabricated buildings was also taking place. Container units in Carson were being retrofitted, temporary trailers in Idaho were being constructed as well as our wood-framed administration building in Texas. Because of the prefabricated construction, our team was able to see progress both on and off-site. With footings in place, our first major milestone was the delivery of the container units. The units arrived on site, craned into place, and then stacked three high, floor by floor. We started with building B, and as we placed the third floor, moved to setting A. It was a great moment for the team to see the site finally taking shape. Next to arrive and set in place were the wood-framed administration building units, soon followed by the temporary sleeper trailers. With the full site in construction, the temporary trailers were moved into place as areas became available. With buildings starting to be completed, we moved to setting our prefabricated elevators, installing the metal walkways around buildings A and B, then moving to making final connections for the underground utilities. After that, we start installing hardscape and landscape throughout the site. Of course, every project has its challenges. For starters, this project needed a new primary electrical service. Showing their commitment to the project, LEDWP was able to provide this in less than two months. Additionally, we needed new public utility taps for domestic and fire water, two new fire hydrants, and new taps to the municipal storm and sewer utilities. Because of the time constraints, the project approach almost immediately became a de facto design-build effort. Each of us, Department of Public Works, NAC Architecture and their consultants, and Bernard's working lockstep and simultaneously negotiating interjurisdictional needs, coordination with the public utilities, design, and construction. Once the green light to build this project, we have very little time. And it is, when you learn about the project, it seems almost impossible to, to be able to build this quickly. We can't build this quickly without everyone 150% invested. And that's not just the design build team, that's not just Vesta, Bernard's, the AE team, that's DPW, and that's every authority having jurisdiction. It is the Los Angeles County Building and Safety, LADWP, uh, LA Sanitation, BOE, it is everyone because it required a village to be able to turn something this large around this quickly. I think we learned and we were a committed team, everybody fully invested and I think that is probably the biggest takeaway is that we need we need not just the, the, the design build team, we need the authorities having jurisdiction to also be as committed as we are to have a very expedited permitting process and be able to start construction, get the key utilities, our water, our power, our sewer. How quickly can we get those? We don't get those very quickly. LADWP, amazing, power pole in three days. That's unheard of. Thankfully, the transparency and collaboration we all brought to the effort was wholly positive 
and equally effective in producing a full-fledged project in the roughly 90 days we had. The success of this project is an absolute testament to the people who lived it every day, from the site security person all the way up to the elected officials. Everyone thinking in innovative ways to collaborate and construct a facility that will provide urgently needed housing for the homeless in Los Angeles. Thank you. I'm just absolutely amazed every single time I see that video. And it just really translates the complexity of the project, the depth and range uh, that was of challenges that were encountered on the project. And as Lou and Louise pointed out, uh, it really took a lockstep commitment hand in hand between the private sector and the public sector to make this project possible. Well, with that, I would like to introduce you to our panelists. Uh, with the interest of time, I will skip bios and get straight to just names and titles, and then we'll get on to our discussion. With us today, we have five panelists. We have representing the owner is Vince Yu, head of project management division two at the Department of Public Works with the County of Los, An oh, the County of Los Angeles. We also have Timothy Ballard, principal at NAC Architecture. We have uh, Mike Funderburg, he's vice president at Bernard's. We have Billy Hall, co-founder of Vesta Modular, and Amanda Gattenby, who is vice president of development at Crete Modular. And so let's get it started with Vince. Vince, it is evident that uh, County Supervisor Hilda Solis was a pioneering source behind this project. Uh, she was just a powerful force and can you please share with us, tell us about the significance of the site of this location and this project. Why this project and why is it so important uh, for the county supervisor? Well, um, I, I would take you back a few more years. Um, actually, this was a site that the county had acquired when I was still overseeing the now canceled um, uh, replacement men's central jail plan. And at the time we were calling it the uh, mental health treatment center. It was the beginning of the county's view of a care first jail last movement. And it really accumulated, even though we bought the site at the time, thinking that we were going to build a parking structure and other supporting services. It was pretty apparent that that wasn't not going to take place. And then uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the county has been pushing for uh, to address the homelessness issue as a, as a regional solution. And as you know, the um, back in 2017, the voters passed, passed Measure H. That's given us some funding. Um, and then last year, earlier last year, um, 2020, COVID hit. Um, at the time, we were already, like uh, Luis mentioned in the video, we were already looking at possibilities of at least housing some of our homelessness there. But it was pretty apparent during the course of, of the year that there needed to be some really positive steps taken. And so I was able to, um, working with other supervisors, um, directed us um, uh, County Department of Public Works um, to come up with a plan um, to provide uh, homeless housing specifically addressing COVID-19. In other words, like Louise mentioned, these will be housing that has its own bathroom and totally self-contained. Because earlier of the year, we were dealing with congregate housing and other converted housing for homeless. But in, in case of COVID-19, we saw the need to have single occupancy homeless housing. And, and um, at the end of October, uh, September 29th to be precise, there was a motion pushed forward by the supervisor's police to um, direct us to build uh, the housing. At the time, so we have already been working with Barnard's, we've already been working with industry. So we quickly put together a plan to address um, and one key point here that I, that I need to mention was that uh, at the same time, the federal government had all, also given uh, counties and states 
um, the coronavirus really fun. So one of the key components of the project, the key of the project was that it was um, mostly funded by the CRF funding. So the mandate to us is that we have to finish before the, or substantially completed before the end of the year. Last the uh, 40-some million dollar uh, CRF funding was vapor. So that was a mandate that I think that part, partial success of the project was that everybody from elected officials to jurisdictional approvals to all the design and construction team, to the subs, to everybody, to the inspectors, that that was a common goal. To tell these providers that our common goal is to substantially complete the project by the end. Thank you, uh, Vince. And, you know, I'd like to have Tim engage you in this discussion as a little bit more about the actual site. Uh, Tim, can you tell us what is this project? What is interim as opposed to permanent housing? And uh, who resides at this, at this site? How are the residents selected? And I will put up your site plan um, so that you can illustrate that as well. Let me put that up. Um, <clears throat> sure, Marcella, while you're putting that up, you know, uh, <clears throat> just kind of continuing the narrative that Vince started, um, you know, we were asked to join uh, the DPW team uh, February, 2020 in, in, in studying a variety of sites either owned by the county or in some cases, even the state and looking at ways to quickly provide um, housing for people experiencing homelessness. And th so this was one of a number of sites. Um, that we had studied for a dormitory style housing. But then when, when COVID hit, you know, March, right? So that was pretty soon into our studies, it became, uh, it, we needed an alternate um, typology, if you will. So that drove us after a number of iterations to um, these, these types of um, single occupancy um, housing units, a bed and a dedicated uh, restroom facility for each, um, each resident. Um, and and I, it, it's, it, the idea is that it is interim housing. So it's part of sort of housing first, right? People experiencing homelessness, the very most important thing is to have them have a place to stay. So um, this gets them off the street, gets them stabilized. And this was envisioned as a, as a component of that, hence the, um, the, um, the administrative offices that provide those support services. Uh, interim housing means the, the plan is that at some point, people transition to permanent housing at, at another location. Um, but given the location of this project uh, right in the, in the heart of downtown, uh, it was seen as an appropriate place to address the most pressing need for the most um, impacted people to have it be an interim housing facility. So, uh, uh, and then the challenge just was for us to design um, a project that met the funding criteria, as Vince mentioned, that the supervisor was able to provide um, it within the time frame uh, uh, that allows. So that really drove the design that you see in front of you here. Um, and just, uh, I'll mention that we, it, now I'm transitioning to the, the buildings themselves. So the, the two buildings at the top of the site plan are permanent construction. Uh, we'll hear from Crate Modular later. Um, the buildings in blue are a more temporary construction, i.e. They, they can be relocated to another site. But this was the concept that we came up with to deliver the um, sort of maximum number of beds with the budget we had in the absolute minimum amount of time. <laughs> and I would like to add to that. Um, the interim nature is very important for the, for the speed of the project because while for the most part it is um, um, co-compliant with um, a lot of this uh, life safety measure built in, but we did take advantage of uh, part of the relaxation due to COVID-19 um, that the, the, both the governor and the county had declared. So we were able to um, take advantage of appendix O in the building code uh, and then and also get certain um, 
jurisdiction approval uh, perhaps a little faster than normal. So that was one of the key to this. And I, speaking of um, the residents, can you share, are the residents paying any rents? Are there any vouchers or section eight being collected? Is that um, relevant to this project? And what services and who's providing the services? Uh, maybe I'll take an attempt at that. Um, the residents would be mainly the focus is in um, uh, because uh, each um, um, po um, political boundary has its own uh, MHH funding, if you will. So we will be primarily focused on the, um, the homeless folks in the, um, uh, Supervisor District 1 and, and CD14. And CD14 been, been, been incredible in helping as a council district 14. Uh, helping move this project along. Uh, they will be focusing on folks that are within 500 feet of the, of the freeway, um, um, on or under the freeway. Um, they will be single occupancy. Um, wraparound services will be provided. We're working with a service provider, one guard um, center association right now. Um, they don't pay rent. They, they, they even folks are really trying to help them to put them on their feet. Uh, they'll be provided with food and then um, uh, everything within, as you, would, as you can see, from the units are all fully furnished. Um, they'll be provided with um, a counseling, provided with um, education, and help to secure um, uh, further employment and one day permanent housing as well. Thank you. And Tim, one of the questions I think that is really important to, to ask here is what about the permitting process? How did, um, one of the things that Lou did mention is that it was an interjurisdictional um, effort and interaction with many different uh, entities. Who were those entities? How did this get permitted? What was the process? Yeah, thanks, Marcella. You know, the process, uh, just looking back on it and in preparing for this discussion, um, I, I think uh, one way to describe the process is that it was very much a big room approach. Uh, you know, now this is kind of formalized in, in sort of like lean management. We didn't really formalize it. We just had to do it to advance the work um, as quickly as possible. So this meant twice a week uh, meetings, of course, virtual. Um, of two to two and a half hours each. So every Monday morning and every Thursday morning with 20 to 25 people on average in these meetings that cut across every, every stakeholder that we, every participant that we needed to advance the cause. Uh, and so, you know, there were many agencies having jurisdiction. There are many utility providers. Um, there are many stakeholders at the county in terms of the permitting process. Um, everyone was in that room and every, so that we could have as much concurrent a processing as possible. You know, you saw on the video that we were, built, we were uh, fabricating the units, approving the, the fabrication plans, approving the foundation plans, building the foundations, treating the soil, all of that virtually concurrently, like in the first 45 days of the project. So the, the key to that was these, this um, group that never said no, that always looked for a solution, that, that sort of crystallized the urgency, if you will. Um, you know, Vince spoke of that, you know, this project made use of the fact that there is a housing emergency and there's been legislation to address that. We use that legislation. We also used the, the tremendous support from the decision makers at the top all the way to Hilda Solis's office that, that you know, Vince would tell us at every meeting, the support, the urgency, and what asked if we needed anything to, to expedite the process. And, and we needed things on a weekly basis, right? So uh, that's kind of the, the flavor of what it took to, to have all this work done concurrently and get us to where we are today. <laughs> And I might add that um, um, the county public works uh, department is really more of an, we function more like an agency. 
where it, where we actually have building safety, we have land development, we have uh, environmental programs division, project management, we're, we're under one roof, uh, under our director. So it is there really not much of a silo, if you will. I mean, we can easily go to our building safety. And, and, and like Tim was saying, our jurisdictional folks are oftentimes a part of our discussion, weekly discussion. Instead of just saying that we, we, allow, we allow you or not allow you to do that, they actually were key to coming up with creative solutions and allow the project to move forward. And I think the county had made it very clear from the supervisors to our director that, um, that providing, um, addressing homelessness, addressing COVID-19 is some of the key things that everybody in the county needs, needs to do. So, we we'll all work with one single goal in mind, that is to, to get this thing built, to get this project built. You know, I think that's exemplary in this project is the, the breakdown of silos and really having interjurisdictional agencies working together to make this project um, successful. Uh, let's, let's transition a bit to the construction side of it. I will stop sharing the screen now. And uh, Mike, I'd like to ask you, about, let's talk about the team. This team has a lot of players involved. You have five main people here, five main different entities. Can you describe the team structure? And also what were the risks, the largest risks that this team faced and how were those uh, risks uh, mitigated contractually? Thank you, Marcella. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Funderberg. I'm with Bernard's. Um, Thank you for uh, letting us share with you today. Uh, the, the, the greatest risk I viewed on this project was uh, disappointing uh, Supervisor Solis, disappointing our client at the county. Um, the, 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 the first call we received regarding this project was in March of 2020, which is an incredibly disruptive time for all of us personally. Um, and we're still somewhat in that mindset today. Um, the, the initial development of this project and, and, and how we came to show you the buildings that you can see in that video today um, were, were through a lot of no contract communication. From March of 2020 through October 19th of 2020, Bernard's and the County of Los Angeles Department of Public Works did not have a contractual agreement of any former type. Um, Vince and procurement and CEO with the County of Los Angeles, along with Bernard's, were extensively trying to work on a, on a contract um, type to deliver the project. Uh, the county has its, its, as its normal discretion, traditional bid build service agreements and, and, and the county's own design build form of agreement. And, and Vincent Yu had the, the foresight to understand that to, to get everybody to act as efficiently and collaborative as possible, we needed to build contract terminology on top of the, um, the, the procurement orders that were handed down for essential services in the beginning of last year, wherein Vince worked hand in hand with myself to develop a cost plus structure um, within the contract with a high degree of visibility to ensure that the risk was appropriately shared between the county and Bernard's and subsequently Bernard's and its subcontractors as well as NAC and its design consultants. Um, that entire period of time we were pricing, I, I checked with our team last night, we were pricing almost 14 iterations of site development um, along with NAC and consultants um, preparing schematic designs for those pricing iterations. Um, our initial steps with the project were to research repurposing options uh, with the LA Unified School District through surplus portable modulars for classrooms. Um, we sent resources to Central Canada to look at um, a, not abandoned, but never utilized um, man camps as they're called and that are, that are basically installed on, on frozen tundra around mining operations. Those would not work for us. 
Uh, we exhaustively researched the modular product line that seemed to make sense on this project, given that we had a 12 week constraint to expend CARES Act funds by December 31st of 2020. Uh, we received an NTP on October 19th, mind you. Um, what that all led us to was the formation of the team that we have. Um, Billy Hall with Vesta Modular is with us today. He's our partner in this project, along with Amanda Gattenby with Crate Modular. Um, our skill set as a general contractor in Los Angeles, um, we're not a modular contractor out of the box, and we needed the professional expertise of Billy and his team at Vesta Modular who could quickly determine um, product sourcing and available manufacturing lines across the country all at once to ensure that we, we could deliver, that we could make these tall commitments to the county to have all these units furnished and installed by December 31st. Um, in addition to Vesta and Crate, who you're going to have the wonderful opportunity to hear speak this morning, um, we were we were somewhat procured in a non-traditional manner because of the orders in place um, by the state and county governments during the procurement process. So contrary to our typical delivery method with the County of Los Angeles, we were able to seek, seek partnerships based on relationship and trust first. Um, keep in mind a lot of this building when we hit the ground and started to work out there was without permit, was with some degree of 50% of or less um, contract document development status. Um, a lot of commitment, and I think Luis Griffin in our intro video really hit the nail on the head. Uh, the contract was just kind of the minimum bar to perform and execute this project. The contract isn't the way it was done. It was through everybody holding up their pole underneath the tent um, at all costs and showing up and delivering on time. Mike, and the structure of the team, uh, who has a direct relationship and how is it, can you give us a little sense yeah, of the yeah, org yeah. chart? Uh, thank you, Martella. So we are contracted directly with the uh, Department of Public Works with the County of Los Angeles um, uh, as a general contractor. And that's Bernard's, yes. That is Bernard's. Um, Vesta Modular is, is a subcontractor to Bernard's. Uh, and Crate Modular is a second tier subcontractor, subcontracted to Crate Modular, who's contracted to Bernard's. In addition to Crate Modular, we have approximately nine different subcontracts that satisfy the site preparation scope, the foundation scope, um, much of the electrical infrastructure on the project site, which is extensive. And we're beginning now that we have uh, operator engaged um, to operate the facility on behalf of the city and the county, uh, we're starting to implement some, implement some low voltage um, system installations on the project as well to control client flow throughout the building and ensure appropriate security on the site. Great, thank you, Mike. And so one of the things that first struck me was we have a general contractor with Bernard's but then we also have a module, modular general contractor. To, um, Billy, can you uh, please share with me with us what is the difference? What is the difference between Bernard's and uh, the modular contractors such as Vesta? What what role do you play in this project, which is a very vital one? And can you please describe that and share more of uh, what you did to bring all these different modular uh, subcontractors to the site. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks, Marcella. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Billy Hall, COO, co-founder of Vesta Modular. Um, we founded Vesta Modular for exactly this type of project where a modular solution is needed under a tight time frame and in a challenging environment. Uh, Vesta was engaged early on to help develop and define the modular building approach with Bernard's and NAC, um, you know, in addition to help bridge the gap from what was being built in the factory to what needed to be completed on site with logistics and um, providing turnkey solution for the modular buildings. A CM like Bernard's and Vesta work well together in understanding the overall project scope and goals to best achieve the success of the project using the modular solutions. Um, Bernard's 
as Mike alluded to, um, you know, they handled all the site requirements, foundations, um, utilities, you know, helping uh, navigate through the challenges of, of the processes of working within the county. Um, and what Vesta focused on was building offsite. We're looking at how, how all this ties together to provide a completion um, modular solution. It was truly a team effort between Vesta and Bernard's um, as well as NSC in the county to, to pull this off. Um, so with, without, you know, without kind of each of us rowing in our direction, trying to, um, you know, understand the challenges and get this done in a tight time frame, uh, it never would have happened. And Billy, why, can you share with us, uh, why were three different uh, modular contractors uh, selected and why do we have some from California and others for outside of California? Um, the, the biggest challenges with this project, you know, besides building during a COVID pandemic, uh, were the tight timeframes, you know, as, as everyone's kind of alluded to before. Um, and understanding the uh, challenges of getting this project built in a tight timeframe, uh, looking at available resources, the only way we knew that we could meet the challenge was to engage several manufacturers to get this project done. Um, we had to get creative in the modular solutions that would work, given the scope and size. You know, we have three different methods that you've seen, you know, with the containerized solution, the permanent wood modular in the admin building, and then the temporary wood modulars with the uh, sleeper units. Uh, you know, we we're trying to keep everything as local as we could, but given the challenges of manufacturing constraints and you know the time of the year we were trying to get this done we really had to kind of think outside the box uh, we were fortunate you know we got crate engaged and they were able to move a project that um, otherwise you know would have would have extended them out past the summer 31st deadline and we were able to team up with with crate to help build the containerized solution um, so that checked the box for for the three-story structure. And then we still had the challenge of trying to meet the timelines for the admin building and the sleeper units. Um, you know, and kind of looking, looking at the broader spectrum, um, you know, we come from the manufacturing world, Vesta, um, and we understand the capabilities of the factories across the US. And, you know, the only way to, to achieve the success of this project in the timeline was to bring outside, uh, outside of California uh, manufacturers to get this done and Gurdon and Palomar. And they were great partners that, that really, you know, helped us uh, get the product built off site so we could get the, the work completed on site. Billy, if I can compliment your, your response a little bit as well, the, 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 there, was an, there, there was a little strategic purpose as well between uh, Tim, Vince and I with the deployment of multiple modular product types. Um, this is this is a component of our industry that's um, that's desperately needed right now, and the solutions are varied across uh, across the board, um, design, construction, and otherwise. What we sought to do um, as an opportunity here is is develop a, a type of project um, under the guidance of the County of Los Angeles, where a a study can actually be completed here to validate. Um, the difference between these types of solutions, these trailers um, that, that, that Billy is communicating uh, about are, are readily available. Um, as I was introduced to them initially, I think Billy, you referred to them as almost like a FEMA um, uh, response um, type kind of product that is regularly deployed um, in the Southeast during extreme weather events and disruption of public utility. Um, yeah. These units have value. Um, they're 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 obviously temporary. They're trailers, um, but the the space requirements that or the space the, the dimensions of these trailers really provide an, uh, a a very spacious solution um, for ex for for folks experiencing homelessness. Um, the container product that that Amanda is going to describe to you is is very intriguing. It's very um, it's a very interesting thing to repurpose a dry goods shipping container, especially given that the Port of Los Angeles is in surplus of these types of products because there's you know a net deficit on export here in Los Angeles. So there are plenty 
of very clean dry goods containers that are sitting in yards around Long Beach. Um, so the diversification of the type of modular on the product was, was also a, a, a key component of really figuring out, can this be replicated? Uh, not only in various jurisdictions and various means, but can the county of Los Angeles replicate this product? Can this serve as an R&D um, type kind of product to help us make best decisions moving forward for subsequent projects and commit to certain modular product types to make it faster and make it cheaper? Thank you, Billy. No, well said. No, I, I would I would agree with all that. I think you know, and and knowing that. You know, we, um, our experience with the manufacturing side of it and understanding that, you know, there's there's a lot of factories out there, um, new factories, of, I'm sure a lot of you have been hearing are popping up all over the place, but, you know, there's capabilities within each factory and, you know, Vesta understands that and, I, and that's where the value we brought to this project was, is understanding, you know, how we were gonna navigate through um, the challenges of not just building during the, the pandemic, but also um, under the tight time constraints and orchestrating this all together. Um, so we're not, Vesta is not a manufacturer. Uh, we go out, we um, engage and, and develop the, the modular plans, scope of work, and we work with several manufacturers um, on this project. Like I said, we were fortunate that Crate uh, was able to step up to the, the plate being a local LA based manufacturer and really they were instrumental in helping us get this off the ground. Thank you, Billy and Mike. And uh, with that, that cues us for Amanda. Amanda, I'd like to um, focus on Crate Modular. You are our local builder, our local manufacturer here. And um, really would like to get a sense of what was it like to receive this call from Billy uh, back in October and to meet this demand in the middle of pandemic were you able to, um, you know, step up to the plate? You obviously did, but uh, what were the challenges that you faced in in coming into this uh, project, and especially in the pandemic? Thank you, Marcella. Thanks for having me here today, Will um, and Marcella as well. So, pandemic. We had an immediate response to pandemic in our factory in March um, due to some early impacts in leadership with us. And as Billy alluded to, we had availability in factory due to other projects pushing from COVID. So it was like sort of this perfect storm. Um, we managed to keep COVID out of our factory from March till November with strict protocols, very quick response times. However, in November, during the fabrication of Vignus, we did have an isolated outbreak, which affected our plumbers. And this is where we leaned on our teammates and Vesta helped to support us by bringing in extra resources to assist. Talk that about was, team, team, yeah. uh, team collaboration there, yes. That was a um, really critical point. Yeah. And um, can you tell us more about your solution, what you bring to the table as a, a shipping container solution? Thanks. Um, we really sort of embody two main principles, sustainability and innovation. So sustainability, we're repurposing building material from trade as, as Mike alluded to. And innovation really modular is the future. And this project is a perfect example of modular being successfully applied. So I have a background in affordable housing um, and I believe that the highest and best purpose for our product is for housing vulnerable populations. So we were more than excited to jump in when we got this call from Billy. We actually fabricated 300 additional beds for homelessness in 2020, um, plus these. So this type of project is really close to our heart and really um, the best, highest and best use of our modular material. Thank you, Amanda. Um, can you share more about how you source your shipping containers? It's just fascinating, the whole concept of just being here in Los Angeles of having two ports and then being able to repurpose them. Any more that you can share about that? 
Sure. Um, as, as Mike mentioned, the US is operating at a trade deficit. So we've seen this to be true even during pandemic. There are many more containers that are being imported than being exported. Um, and overseas countries don't usually want to pay to send an empty back. They would rather send us another full one full of goods. So what we're doing is we're leveraging these steel boxes, which are highly regulated, um, have a lot of structural integrity and we're leveraging them as building material. And by doing this, we are able to divert waste from landfills, we have a cleaner job site, and we use green building methods in general in our factory. That's amazing. It's really um, making an impact, positive impact to our environment as well. You know, I'd like to talk about cost for this project. Uh, Mike, Tim, um, or Vince, can you share more about what is the actual cost of this project without the land and the cost per unit? That's a question that comes up quite often. And I know the audience would like to know. Yeah, certainly. Uh, everybody would like to know the answer to that question, including <laughs> Vincent and myself. Um, the project is nearing completion. Uh, we're targeting a completion uh, milestone of April 1st, and uh, the county is targeting a um, uh, first client date of April 7th. Um, as I'm sure you can imagine, you're all you're all you're all associated in our industry. Um, the 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 pace of what we're doing is is leaving uh, issues that need to be resolved in its wake. Um, Currently, the project is approved for funding. Uh, Vince, I believe it's 50, 53 million? Um, no, uh, 57 million. 57 million. Yeah, um, but the thing is that um, uh, you can't just look at the 57 It's actually a lot of things that are rather unusual for this project. Um, we've included admin, we've included a lot of site development that otherwise would not be applicable necessarily to other uh, the all these units came fully furnished TV, refrigerator and everything else and then also we included in part of that 57 million dollars certain startup um installation most likely an other project will fall not of cost for the operation and a big a, a big component of the overall budget, which Vince described at the top of the session, is is CARES Act uh, funding, is federal CARES Act funding. And Vincent, it's okay. It's, a, it's okay to get bombed by by your pets on Zoom. I think everybody appreciates that. Um, the 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 CARES Act funding contingent of it all really, um, you know, November was an election year, a, a, a presidential election year. Um, with with great turmoil, I think on on all sides of the fence, um, the the certainty we had from county council and CEO and the Department of Public Works through through Vince Anthony Nivy and and ultimately uh, Director Pastrea uh, was the, the the language at the time was the CARES Act funding must be spent by December thirtieth of twenty twenty. Uh, we entered into contracts, we entered into subcontracts, and we proceeded to expend as fast as we could uh, every one of those dollars. Um, total price per bed, total, total cost of project, um, that type of certainty I think we'll have by the end of April here. Um, but by all accounts from, from those that track these metrics, of which I am, you know, certainly not a professional on, on cost per bed for, for the homeless population, but our, our initial understanding of this is, 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 our, is our price point for this project is extremely low compared to some of the other options that have been deployed. And with all the conditions I've outlined for you about how fast we had to work, so that's multiple shifts. We were working during the pandemic were we were we were hit crate was hit vesta was hit with with covid infections on on our teams in our staffs um those are a lot of factors that increase cost on a project um so as excited as we all are to communicate when the time's appropriate um the actual price per bed for this project 
I fully anticipate the second, the third, the fourth on forward projects of this type and nature to come down in cost significantly. And if I could speak to <clears throat> from the design side of the house on to this you know, sort of narrative here, what assisted us in delivering it was also, I, I, I think, a somewhat unique configuration, right? These, these are 160 square feet per bed for the permanent, uh, the container structures that uh, Amanda um, uh, so eloquently described, and 170 for the so-called sleeper units, those one-story trailers. Okay, so this is a, this is a, you know, a very targeted approach to the, the unique um, a charge that we had provide housing for people experiencing homelessness, it needs to address the COVID pandemic. So a, they needed to be individual units. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that was the process that we spent from uh, March to October, really refining, figuring out what's the best model to do this. And, and then we were able to deliver with a very streamlined um, building type that focuses, laser focus on the beds, and, and the providing of individual units for e each of the 232 people. Um, and, uh, you know, like Mike says, I think we're gonna sort of learn about how to uh, identify efficiencies uh, for, for future work and how to deploy this type and other types of, of designs for addressing the needs of people experiencing homelessness. <laughs> no, I agree with you completely, Tim. One thing, I, one thing I'd like to add, I mean, the, the common question I think all of us have received um, on the panel here is, can this be replicated? Um, and and I, I don't know that we're entirely certain it, it can in every case. And I, I, I want to be clear on, on our part here. This project was procured by, um, by the public through the County of Los Angeles um, under exempt status through orders of our public officials, right? And the degree of influence everybody had uh, with the city, the county, um, each distinct um, utility service provider uh, was, was very, very high, very, very high. Um, and I'm of the mind that some degree of legislation is needed for our public servant partners, such as Vincent Yu, to be able to replicate this. We need to be able to realize permanent power on a property um, in weeks, not years, which is what it can take in certain cases um, with the utility services. You know, we need the land. You know, this site is contaminated, heavily contaminated. It was a, it was a foundry for a number of years. Um, that, that, was a, that was an incredible expense on the site to be able to do that. Its centralized location is in critical importance to, to Supervisory District 1. Um, but, but all of these factors do need some, some degree of, of, of political effort here. And we need some degree of legislation to allow the county, to allow the city to expedite, to think outside the traditional boxes that prevent the, everybody from moving fast. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in addressing this question of replication, um, the, the, what comes to mind for me is that, you know, you heard Mike speak to the risk that everyone took on, and I think he characterized it very well. Um, the response, though, to that risk was, we need to not disappoint the elected official that asked us to do this, right? The response was tremendous support from the elected official and the entire team, you know, the entire public team that, that was charging us to do this. And, and you know, Replicating that is a little bit the secret sauce because that's what it took to get every single person, you know, from, uh, you know, like the, Lou said at the outset, you know, from the security person to Mike and everybody in between to just step up for the project, right? And, and that's what it took um, to, to realize this. And I think in terms of learning how to continue to address this, this tremendous need for housing. It's a housing emergency. The state has declared it. So we need to learn from that, how that sense of urgency allowed us to do this. And, and uh, yeah, and do we need legislation or, or what things can make that replicatable? Because, you know, it was a bit of a perfect storm to have COVID hit right when we were starting. <laughs> um, but, but we can learn a lot from that. 
Yeah, the, the perfect storm actually allow us to bypass certain things. And I think uh, Mike and, and, and Tim are absolutely right. I, I think, you know, to some degree, um, I don't think product is totally replicable uh, in other circumstances because it happened to be a site that we're familiar with because we bought it to, to, for, the, for the replacement uh, geo project. We have all the site utilities and, and, and earthwork and everything all figured out ahead of time. Um, but yet um, the legislation and having a political champion, I think really opened door for us. Um, and having certain things that definitely replicable, which is that the team from the elected official all the way down to the folks building it uh, in the crate factory, for example, will all have the common purpose, have a common goal. And I think that is definitely uh, replicable in, in other circumstances. And people, the willingness to break down silos, there's a uh, willingness to take certain risks with, um, for example, I would go to the jurisdictional uh, authority and said that, yeah, I know we have not got this fully permitted and figured out, but you have my word that we will get it built uh, to, a, to a degree that you can permit it and, 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 and accept it. So, and we make good on that. And, you know, Mike and um, Billy may have to go back a couple of times, you know, sometimes to fix things. We got it done. We, we uh, were good. Um, so certain things definitely can be replicable. There, there, there are other things that may not be as apparent um, for us um, um, that we also learned is that for when it comes to modular construction, we're limited by the capacity of the, of the factory. Unlike, you know, if you have any other site built projects that um, you just hire more workers, bring more stuff, but that doesn't quite work out. So, you know, Billy alluded to earlier that that's why he selected multiple subs to do the work. I think that's definitely is a lesson that can be replicable somewhere else. Well said, Vint. Perfect. And so with that, um, you know, I really, it, 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 it's great to see, it's evident to see that this project from a, one standpoint, it, it, the challenges that it faced uh, really truly needed this uh, dynamic um, cooperative team effort where uh, it had a political champion to assure that all the entities uh, involved, uh, we're on board to make this project happen as quickly, as rapidly as it did. Um, while at the same time, there are elements that we can say, should another jurisdiction or should you have the land, you can bring these elements to place. This is replicable. We can bring these modular units to house the homeless and solve and provide a solution to house the homeless um, in a fast and, and cost-effective way. Right. I mean, but it does take some element of of um, political championing. You have to have somebody there. And, and that's what's a big challenge. That's the biggest challenge of all. With that, um, I think we are ready for our Q&A section. Uh, Will um, has been collecting um, a series of questions from the chat while we've been having this discussion. And let's open it up to the audience. And I did share the video in the chat um, earlier today. I will uh, paste another link of the video for anybody who miss, might, might have missed a video and would like to share it with any of your colleagues. Um, it's available to you through this chat. So uh, Will, will you um, open it up to questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, so for everyone in the audience, thank you for joining us. Uh, we welcome you and encourage you to add your questions to the chat and then we'll call on you. Um, if Lance Simon is available, I'd love to have him address the uh, the panel. He has a great question about um, how HSID's accessibility department may have been involved. Lance, are you on the call? Yeah, I'm here. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah, welcome. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so we do a lot of work as architects and construction managers, and we're running into challenges with HCID and um, and accessibility because they are, you know, because of the lawsuit that happened. They're they get into the weeds, and I'm curious about how if if HCID's involved, how you were able to avoid the uh, 
the complications and, and complying with all of the accessibility down to the 16th of an inch. Tim, you want to take this? Sure, but I just to, uh, to make sure I'm speaking to the right um, terms. Can H Sid? Can you uh, spell that out? H C I D. H C I D. Uh, standing for. It's, uh, is it H C D? Yeah. H C D. Department of Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay, right. That's what I thought. I just wanted to to yeah. uh, to make sure. Um, it, you know, the the inter we had many AHJs, authorities having jurisdiction to coordinate to put all these pieces together, you know, and that was an integral part of our strategy to accelerate the schedule. Um, you know, we'll, we're still working out the details uh, and that that that's, I think, a key challenge in each each jurisdiction looks at codes differently they look at accessibility differently you know and so indeed we go through housing and community development amanda's team did an incredible job putting together a package and taking that through and supporting it right i was just on a call yesterday to to um sort of come back and tr and wrap up the 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 requirements that are on the plans for manufacturing the buildings as well as the the plans for siting the buildings, right, which are two different AHJs, and we have to get those to work together. And we have to manage the risk, you know, uh, which we've done every step of the way with our partners at the county, right? So to make sure that, you know, there is not an, an answer of like, we need a 16th of an inch here and a, a foot there, and then now there's no risk, right? What we've really been um, as transparent as we can about the level of accessibility we're providing, how it works, and how we believe it's consistent with both the code requirements and the performance requirements that the county and the city, right, because the city will be operating this, have communicated to the team. So, I mean, that's kind of a high level answer. <laughs> um, Let me clarify something. The county is actually taking building safety jurisdiction for the site. Um, as, as most county islands within the city, the county would take jurisdiction over the building safety. But obviously, this being modular, so the state housing and community development also has jurisdiction over it. But as far as, as HCID, the housing uh, investment department of city, uh, they, they actually did not check our drawings. It's the county who permitted the uh, the, the the entire project. Um, but to, uh, to to answer your question regarding accessibility, um, of the 132 units in the modular um, uh, the the um, container modular that uh, that that Amanda's team built, they're all 100% accessible. As, as the other, the sleeper unit, the single story trailer units, I think 5% of them are accessible. Correct. The, the administration building is fully accessible and the site is fully accessible as well. Yep. But if, if I may add on, I, it seems like you actually do have an opportunity because of having, you know, offsite, you know, better controlled environment for the most part to Build within or below or, or well above industry tolerances. So hopefully that works out well. Yeah. Right. And, and it is one of the benefits of modular. You know, once we worked it out, which was not easy <laughs> um, with Amanda's team, I mean, and that was a, a, com a completely collaborative effort, you know, those dimensions are fixed, right? Uh, because the there, there's a nice steel container around them. So that does give us a certain level of rep replicability across those 132 units. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. The, the modular process, we go through the state approval, um, you know, for what gets built off site rather than at the local level. The, the California Department of Housing and Community Development is the agency that oversees this in California. We had to provide a design that was approved through them and the inspections happen at the factory by their third party agency. Uh, so this is where things get inspected and, and signed off on at the factory before it shows up on site. And then as Vince described, because it's a county owned property, at, when it shows up on the site, uh, the county is the lead, county building and safety is the lead for coordinating 
the work and for permitting any on-site work. Yeah. And, and this is where the being a single agency helps because you know it, it's, we're not siloed in that in that sense. Um, so uh, building safety folks are work with us uh, hand in hand to get the project moving. Yeah, I mean, in our big room, we had multiple members of building and safety, uh, uh, at both both managers and inspectors on the call throughout the project, so that we were, you know, transparent about the process. Great question, Lance. Um, Mark, Mark, are you on the call? You have a really excellent question as well that I think a lot of people on the on the call will be interested to learn more about. Yeah, I'm here. Um... First of all, big kudos to everybody on, on the panel here. What you achieved is amazing. And I realized there was a lot of luck and stuff that fell into place, but it, it takes amazing people to make that happen nonetheless. Um, my question is um, something we all battle with on our projects and how do, you get, how do you get DWP to give you power so quickly? What was the process to coordinate to make that happen? Even knowing that it's a high priority um project and everything it's still you know for the rest of us it seems like it doesn't matter how high priority our project is dwp just doesn't seem to care <laughs> can i can i start our response to your question with a story um absolutely we, we arrive um on site vince gives me the keys to his four and a half acre parking lot uh, we mobilize a mobile crusher and a treatment plant to treat the soil we're there maybe four days and uh, we need to move primary power. There was power servicing lighting circuits on that property. Um, okay, this is gonna take six months, right? We make the phone call, the work order gets scheduled, the LADWP mobilizes on site. They see we're running um, essentially a mobile crushing operation and we have heavy equipment that's driving within 15 feet of the power poles. The crew says they're not gonna work that day. They prepare to pack up and go home. That crew has to call in to the office uh, to reschedule or cancel the work order. They make the phone call, uh, Lou Diaz um, and our superintendent Clint Colwell, as well as myself were on site. When we watch the boom go back up to the pole after this phone call is made. And miraculously this 15 foot space constraint problem that, that the crew had, they didn't have anymore. And we were able to work together. And that day, they decommissioned the permanent power that was somewhat affecting the site. This is incredibly atypical. And I know all of you understand how long it can take to get utility. This is the component I'm honestly describing when I'm talking about some type of legislation or some type of rule per se to develop an expedited service line at, at LADWP. Um, we, had, we had the benefit of Vince's uh, connections within the, the structure of, county, of the county, um, the connectivity between the county and city. We had the advocacy of Judge, the Honorable Judge Carter, who toured the site himself personally um, and shook almost every hand he could, contrary to our request that he did not shake hands. Um, there was a lot of pressure on people to find no excuses to perform. That's how the LADWP story happened on this project. You know, I, I'm going to give kudos to our, our city partners, but, but one thing I really want to emphasize and may not have emphasized before was that this is, while this is a county project, the uh, LA City also helped to fund the project uh, as they are part of the LA um, Los Angeles Homeless uh, uh, Services Authority, they they and the county are partners. As a matter of fact, um, um, a, a, a lot of the funding for operating this facility um, comes from City of uh, uh, Los Angeles CD14 as well. So, so it is really a joint county city project, and I think everybody. From, from the top to, to the bottom, if you will. Um, everybody had identified that, that have that joint goal in mind. And so is DWP, so is the, our department, um, of, of Department of Public Works, so is Sanitation um, District, so is Fire Department, so is Public Health. 
everybody has the same goal in mind. And, and, I, and that I could not emphasize that enough um, because that in the end opens doors. Uh, people start thinking outside the box Instead of uh, putting up roadblocks, they start to look, look for ways that can help you navigate. Not that we're um, circumventing codes. And I want to emphasize that we're not circumventing codes, but we're looking for creative ways to, to, to address those. And then we saw that from everybody and, and then some really um, um, grateful to our city partners um, for stepping up to the plate and perform. Great question, Mark. Um, and just for everyone else on the call, AIA, we are developing a letter of recommendation that we will give to DWP on how we can uh, improve their services. And uh, I'll make sure everybody on this call is uh, has access to that letter of recommendations. Um, Tibby Dunbar, you have a few questions. Welcome. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh my God. Hi. Um, I had a yeah. I had a few questions. I mean, I, kudos again. This is an amazing project, um, and it seems that it does seem to take a pandemic to make these things happen, along with Project Room Key, um, which is uh, too bad. But this is a good outcome. Um, I wondered when you mentioned the site. I wasn't. How many sites like this are there, contaminated or otherwise, around LA County? Um, I wanted to find out also how long can someone, this is a different level of question, but how long does someone get to stay in this project? And so you said that they, these are necessarily temporary because they are shipping containers, but um, I've, I know I've read of projects that were residential projects that architects have been experimenting with where they were um, using shipping containers and they were not meant to be temporary. So I just wondered why that was necessarily the case that this was to be an interim and not a permanent, not that interim is not a bad thing, but I'm um, just curious about, about that comment that because of shipping containers, they're of course temporary. Yeah, if I um, could address that last point maybe, um, because mm -hmm. I've, I, you know, as an architect, I've had to learn the terminology through, through the project and I wanna share my clarifying experience, okay? The, the shipping containers are permanent construction. It's on a port of place concrete foundation. It's a permanent building by any definition of a building. Right, it's it'll be there for a hundred years, literally. The service is temporary in that the people, the service provided to the people who live there is not a permanent solution to their housing needs. Right, it's interim housing, and therefore, at some point, the the service providers will figure out how they can move on to a permanent housing solution. Right, that's the housing solution use of permanent, not building. Right. And then the other component of the project that we call temporary as architects, right, is the trailers that Billy described and you saw. And those are temporary in that they can be easily relocated. They are not on permanent foundations. They are on jack stands, um, all code compliant, but they could be relocated to another site um, at such time that a a different or better use is found for this part of that site. So I just wanna, because it took me a long time to navigate this definition, right? There's the building definition and there's the service definition, right? So okay. interim housing in the housing world is seen as a temporary solution, i.e. you don't live in interim housing for 30 years, right? Um, and, and the service providers figure out how to transition someone to permanent housing. We may even yet see a, a permanent housing development replacing the blue ones on the on the screen there um, as a component to this project. There's been a lot of interest in that. The site could certainly support higher density at, at such time that like funding was was uh, located for that. And then that would be permanent construction and a permanent housing solution, i.e. one could live there as long as you as you pay the rent associated with your lease. So I uh, I just wanted to offer yeah. that as a starting uh, point for the discussion. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, that makes a lot of, that, that's uh, and Let me also add to that, yeah. um, because we're using the um, CARES Act funding. So by definition, it is to deal with a COVID-19 emergency. So it, by definition, is emergency housing, therefore it's interim. Right, right. But again, that's the use, right? 
And so, but of the building types on the site, the uh, Amanda's modulars plus the administration building is permanent construction, albeit um, built off site and then located on the site. Um, the blue is available for relocation in terms of the construction type. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that, that sounds, yeah. But, but I, I am curious though, do we know how many sites like this there exist in LA County? Um, that's a hard question to answer. I, I, I don't know offhand what that, you mean. The, the county owns many, uh, a lot of real estate, but, um, but um, this is a unique situation where we have a piece of property that's, um, uh, it's not done, uh, that's bought for something else. However, I, I, I must say um, it, 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 it serves two meanings because it, it really taking something that's meant for a detention facility and using it to provide service to the homeless, I think has a, has a very deep meaning. That, that's why we're calling it the, the uh, Hilda El Solis um, Care First Village. Great question, Tibby. Uh, Helmi, you're on the call and you have a few questions. And you know, I, I just wanna say while you're here, thank you so much for your leadership on all things housing over the last decade. Helmi, welcome. Hi, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, first of all, it's just a really great panel. I'm learning a lot. And uh, so thank you for putting it on and for all the great panelists. Um, my question really ties into the last, the last question and the conversation that was just taking place about density. Because I think this site arguably could be six to one FAR, you could be going up, you know, 20, 30 stories. And in a housing crisis, we need to not underbuild. Um, so my question is really uh, kind of two pieces. One, could you have built the modular at a higher density? And then two, if you do eventually develop this as permanent housing, um, would you, you know, what, what does that look like in terms of, you know, both density and how, like what's kind of the, is there a vision in place for the future here? Um, uh, yes, there is. In fact, Vince actually asked, asked us to draw it. <laughs> and we have, we have the artist's conception of what uh, five stories over a podium of permanent housing would look like on the portion of the site that um, has the blue temper uh, the blue uh, buildings. And, you know, I, I like the question about highest and best use. And what, you know, and, and my team's heard me talk about this before that we'd love to find the highest best use and make it happen. But in the, in the arena that we were working with, um, with public works and the, the priorities established by the elected officials and the funding that became available, it was really what I call the art of the possible. <laughs> to We were asked to do make this facility to address the need, the very immediate needs. Um, and, and that's what we did. And I, I think um, it, I've just experienced a tremendous um, you know, galvanizing of attention now that this permanent building is there and people ask, well, what's it for? And you, you go meet them at the site and you explain it to them. It's like, wow, this, this is fascinating. This is amazing that this is being done in place of a, a, a site originally, you know, purchased for, a, for a, a extending the, the central jail, yet here it is now as part of this care first process. And so I, I just, I, indeed, is that the highest and best use? I, I don't know, I'm not a developer, but I do know it's been galvanizing attention as to what is possible when, when we shift our priorities and, and we, we, we um, uh, it have a political will to address. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just um, add to that. And, and really it's a matter of timing because we, we want to take advantage of the CARESEC funding. And we, we really literally asked Tim and, and Mike what can you guys build and give us and, and have it substantially completed by the end of the year? And this is what they came up with. I asked Tim, I said, why didn't we go five stories since we're elevator? And it's just two more stops. But Tim said, you know, Vince, if you want that, it's gonna take you longer to, to structure engineer and we may not make it. And then 
it was also a, a, a good decision because we saved the, the sec second half of the site for future development to address the very thing that you're asking because the, the trailer units, we can put the axle back on, put the wheels back on, haul them away to address other urgent needs and have the and and have a more time to plan for the second half of the of the site. Thank you. Great. Really, really interesting. Thank, thank you, Helmi, for the question. Uh, Todd Erlinson, you're on the call, and you, this is sort of a follow up to that question. Do you want to join us? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Tim, for you kind of started to address my my question, but I think my question was for someone on the call who might understand the bigger picture of homelessness in LA in a different way, kind of a larger scale way, is building 232 kind of small, you know, transitional housing units uh, for the cost that we spent on this project, is that what we need right now? Like these are not gonna be permanent apartments, right? They're very small and they're, and they're great for uh, helping people transition from homelessness to a more permanent situation. But um, given the cost of the project and what the, and the, and the magnitude of the problem, right? I was just reading about what's going on down in Echo Park this morning in the LA Times. Is this the highest and best use for those funds in solving the big, the big picture? I don't know who's on the call that, that might know more about kind of the big homeless problem in, in LA. But uh, that was about the question. And then the idea of the foreseeable future, what happens to these projects after we solve the homeless problem, let's say, right? What happens, what happens to these buildings then? Well, let me take a step of that, uh, on that chart. Uh, um, the, the primary function, as you will, you know, from the, from the funding source is address the COVID-19 issue among the amount of people experiencing homelessness. And it's just so happened that it also addresses the uh, homelessness crisis at the same time. So yeah, so they were designed purposefully for single occupancy. Now, um, would the county and the city address uh, homelessness in a different way? I, you know, I'm not a, a, a homeless housing expert either. Um, we're, 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 I'm an architect by trade and then project manager um, by, by profession. But yes, I do see that um, um, both modular construction would be a quick way to address homelessness because, you know, doesn't matter how you slice it, there are 60,000 people within LA County, within all the cities in the county. That, um, that will need to be uh, rapidly rehoused. Um, so hopefully the supportive services will help uh, terminate some of that uh, homelessness. Um, but, but there are definitely good lessons to be learned. And, uh, and module construction may not be in the form that we have taken here, um, could definitely address that. For example, we look at different options of doubling up the, mod, the, the container unit instead of 160 square feet, they could be 240, they could be 320 um, um, uh, square feet each. Uh, that would definitely address, and they could turn into section eight housing with housing voucher and all that. So there is a permanent solution out there. And I guess at the very least, this project gives us the, 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 the way, a way to learn from it. Todd, great question. Um, you know, we only have a few more minutes. Before we go back to Marcella, you know, this might be a question for Vince, and I'm really curious from your perspective, how can we mobilize the support you need so that we can get General Hospital repurposed as quickly as possible for, for housing? I, I feel like you have um, so many great architects and structural engineers here in Los Angeles. We want to help as, as quickly as we can for the county. Well, I agree. I agree. Um, um, but 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 I think it's something that we said earlier. Um, I think the political will, having a political champion behind it, um, to define a common goal, would be the most important uh, thing in making things happen. I think we got great builders, great architects, great engineers, great project managers, great subs. We can do anything. But I think the leadership at the very top is the most important in my opinion. 
Well, well, thank you. You know, that's we're we're here to help support that. So we're you know, thank you for you and the service the county's doing. Uh, Marcella, we'll go back to you for some closing comments. Yeah, well, thank you, Will. You know, this is a very important dialogue. It's a very complex issue. Um, there are so many elements to solving this problem that need to be addressed, but this is one solution to it. And whether it has it has elements that can be replicated and it has elements that, you know, this set, sets a precedent, sets an example of what can be done in order to address this uh, issue in a very rapid and cost effective manner. And I hope, um, you know, we can see more of this replicated in other sites in the future and quickly because it can be done with the will behind it, with political will behind it. Um, and like you said, there are talented um, individuals in the private sector, architects, engineers, uh, builders, everybody out here is willing to do it and put their energy behind it. But we need the legislation and we need uh, the political will to make a difference. So with that, I wanna thank you, Will, uh, for your gracious invitation to be here, part of this panel, to be part of the discussion for your Design for Dignity series. And we look forward to um, attending your conference and being part of it then as well. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today.